Good morning, and welcome to our Worship Together Apart. Uh, the latest update from the province didn't really give any insight as to whether or not we'll be able to be meeting in the near future. So we'll go ahead and begin our worship service with the singing of our doxology. O oh God, we wait for you alone, for our hope is from you. You only are our rock and our salvation, our fortress. In you we will not be shaken. On you rests our salvation and our glory. So at all times and in every situation, we put our trust in you and pour out our hearts before you. When we doubt, open our eyes to the love and care you have shown toward us how you gave your Son to redeem us and cleanse us from our sin. When we fear, strengthen our faith in you, the one who created and maintains the whole world, and who chose us even before its foundation. When we fail, restore us and establish our walk firm in your everlasting word. When we suffer, fill our hearts with joy and peace as we serve and strive to show your glory to a lost and dying world you are a loving caring god a great shepherd to your people and a mighty shield for the righteous 
To you alone be our praise and glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Luke chapter 12, verses 27 through 31. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not ye what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Have you ever played a video game before? Pokemon, Fortnite, Mario Kart, Halo, or Zelda? When I was younger, I spent my own fair share of time on video games. And as I was thinking about this message, I was comparing the virtual reality experience of video games to the reality of real life. Reading about some of the psychology behind video games, I came across a concept I had never heard of before, and it's called flow, and it's a completely focused mental state. What a well-designed video game does so well is that it's challenging enough to keep your interest, but it's not too challenging to make you give up. And if you've played a really good video game before, you've experienced this. You're locked in. You could play for hours as you seek to complete whatever quest the game has handed to you. So now let's turn to real life. Life may not always be as exciting and colorful as a video game, but we all are seeking to do something. 
with this life God has given us. And the Lord, in his wisdom, in his sovereignty, in his goodness, he's given us an overriding quest. His will for your life includes what he wants you to seek. Because we all have choices on what to seek after and what to pursue in this life. And God's word directs us on a pursuit, which we're to pursue with single-mindedness, absolute focus, a completely focused mental state that a psychologist might call flow. Let me show you what this quest is. Looking at Luke 12, Jesus has taught us in his parable of the rich fool not to covet, not to have this strong desire to acquire more and more material possessions. That's sin. And Jesus says, don't do it. Don't do it. Instead of thinking about how you can be generous towards yourself, put your mind and your resources towards being generous towards God. Don't even worry yourself over the very basic needs of life because God will provide those for you. So you can see why our outlook should be so different from the messages and the values of this world. Our outlook is different because our theology is different. Our seeking should be different. We are people of faith. And that's where Jesus is going with his disciples. Our faith should make a difference. It's our amount of faith that will make the difference here. Because if we're coming up short when it comes to trusting God, then in this respect, we're pretty much like the rest of the world that doesn't know God. Take God's work in nature, for example. Jesus already told us how God cares for birds, even nasty, unclean ravens. If he makes sure they're fed, God will surely feed us. And then don't worry about clothing either. Jesus says in Luke 12, 27, Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not, and yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Just look at the lilies, the flowers. They don't work. They don't make their own clothing or go to the mall to buy clothes that someone else made for them. But the Lord makes sure that those flowers are visually stunning in their beauty. Beyond anything, the wonderfully wise and wonderfully wealthy King Solomon could have ever provided for himself. And these are just plants we're talking about. Here today, gone tomorrow. Yet God cares about them too. So of course he's going to take care of you. Don't live in suspense over your stuff, your finances, your earnings. He'll take care of us. And if we doubt that, then we have a faith problem. If we fail to trust God for his provision, we are among the ye of little faith Jesus was speaking of. If our life is about seeking after material things, even the basics of life, our trust in the Lord is deficient. Our confidence in him to sufficiently provide for his children is insufficient. God is your father, isn't he? Then how different should your seeking be from the rest of the world? They don't know God as their father. So what else would they make life about than the stuff? Jesus draws this contrast. Luke 12, 30. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your father knoweth that ye have need of these things. The rest of the world doesn't know God as their father. So how would they trust him to meet their needs? But the Christian is a child of God. And God is the ideal father who knows, who cares, who meets the needs of his children. So this is a call to radically shift our seeking. What we are seeking must change. What we are striving for must change. If God wants to assure us that he'll meet our material needs, then this is a relief. This gives us the luxury to concern ourselves with something else, something better. What's that? Luke 12, 31, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. There's something else to strive for. The future kingdom of the Messiah. This should be our completely focused mental state, our singular pursuit, what we are all about. And Jesus says, if we concern ourselves with seeking his future kingdom, 
Instead of material possessions, God will take care of providing those material benefits for us. So how do we do this? How do we seek after the kingdom of God? Well, one way we know for sure is what Jesus has already made clear back in verse 21 at the conclusion of that parable of the rich fool. Jesus said, we're all faced with a choice to be foolish by laying up treasure for ourselves or to be wise by being rich towards God. How can you be rich towards God? And that's what I plan to bring out next week as I finish out this section from the Gospel of Luke. But I don't want to leave you with nothing to go on. So I'll conclude with some helpful words I found from one commentator. How do we know if we're being rich or generous towards the Lord? That's the question. He says, this is a test that we have to engage in privately before the Lord. No one can tell someone else exactly how to answer such questions, for there's no magic percentage that is to be reached. How can you seek God's kingdom by being rich towards God? Considering a section of scripture written to those who have grown discouraged in living the Christian life. Christian life has turned out to be difficult and agony. Sometimes it might be an attack from without uh, family, friends, workmates, enemies, uh, people problems. Or maybe it's uh, sickness. Other times it's an attack from within. It's our own sin, our struggles, the struggles of all sorts that we have as human beings, uh, things that others may never know or see, but they run deep and they hurt deeply. We think, if only I could have a break, a rest from this, and there are some who give up. 
The example of some who fell short of entering into God's promised rest is the Old Testament Israelites found in Hebrews chapter 3. And the writer picks the warning up in chapter 4 verse 1 to not give up like they did, not to fail to enter rest. He starts with an appeal first to fear. That's what we considered last week. And the point is that we shouldn't take our promised rest of heaven for granted, especially if we're excusing sin in our lives or thinking that, that God's not going to judge it. And so we read Hebrews 4, verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. For the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. The point said is to not be complacent in a Christian life, but never lose hope. And the writer in these verses quickly holds out to us just that, a blessed hope. We are to deal with sin, but we don't deal with sin by despairing about it. The way to rest is shown in the rest of chapter 4 through the example of one who did enter. We've seen those who came short. Well, let's see someone who made it home. And so we turn to that example. Now, the first thing the author does is to prove that there actually still is a rest to enter. Some people might think that since God would not allow the Israelites to enter rest, that the rest itself was canceled. Or we might think, well, if I fail like these did in the wilderness, there's no hope for me. When making the claim that the rest still exists, the writer insists in verse 3 that some, those who believed, they are even now entering into rest. So in his view, the rest is still existent. He proves this. He gives two arguments. First, he points that the rest he's talking about existed before the children of Israel were offered it and failed. So in verse 3, the oath, it's made by God that they would not enter. But then notice in the latter part of the verse, after that colon, that even before the children of Israel were offered the rest, the rest already existed. The rest dates from, he puts it, the foundation of the world. So the children of Israel might have been offered it, but it existed long before them and the offer to them. It didn't begin and end with them and their failure. There has always been the offer of rest. Failure does not eliminate the hope forever. Two quotes then are given to back up that assertion, verses 4 and 5. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. Here's the quote. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, here's the second quote he's giving. If they shall enter into my rest. And then he makes the conclusion. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter in. And they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Right, no, the rest then. The first, it refers to God's rest at the end of creation. He worked six days, created, but on the seventh he rested. What happened on the eighth day? Well, he did not begin working again. So the conclusion is the rest continues to this day. So here we have before the people of Israel failed, the rest was already there, it was available. The rest offered to them then was not new, as if rest did not exist before the promised land. The rest of God existed from the creation of the world. All right, the second quote that he gives is from Psalm 95. He states it there in verse 5. And it's been the main text that we've used throughout. It's the one we looked at last week that was found, again quoted, Psalm 95, in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 11. 
So he offers it here as proof that the children of Israel did not enter the rest. After all, God swore that they would not. The conclusion then that we're asked to draw is found there in verse 6. And verse 6 reads this way. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein. And then he notes some didn't. But he said some still must enter therein. So Israel did not, some will, some must enter. So God's rest will not go ungiven. It's still out there. It's available. And the writer of Hebrews pulls out again Psalm 95 as proof. It's stated this way, verse 7. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, here he's quoting again, Psalm 95, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus, now this refers to Joshua, and I'll explain that in a moment. So if Joshua had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? So it existed before the people of Israel failed to enter it, and it existed after the children of Israel, that other generation, took it. All right, so verse 7, again, Psalm 95, same word of God that's been quoted back in verse 5. And again, the point is made that David is referring to a rest in Psalm 95 that was existing in his day. <clears throat> Now, he writes some 400 years after the rest was denied to that generation of Israel that came out of Egypt and perished in the wilderness. But we also bring out then the thought, well, what about that people that did enter the promised land in Joshua's day? They entered. Well, is the rest over then? Is it no longer available? No. Verse 8 reiterates this point. It says that Joshua... And I noted there, it states it as Jesus. Jesus is the Greek equivalent of the Old Testament Joshua. That's who's being referred to here. So Joshua did lead these people in the promised land and God's rest. But David, he says, is writing years, 400 years after that happened. So it must be that we would conclude then, verse 9, there is a rest still out there. For us, it started a creation, it still continued, even after a failure in the day of Moses, but also, it's also available even after it was successfully entered into by Joshua and the people of Israel. So there is a rest possible for God's people, even after failure. And there's a rest that is still available. God has a rest for his people. Now, we'll come back to answer the important question of what sort of rest the writer is talking about. But we first need to note something, and that is found in verse 10, the word he. Who is the he that is being referred to here? Well, there are several interpretations that are given. I'll state the ones that I would disagree with and, and why. First, some people say that this is talking about the believer at the point of salvation. Uh, they stop trusting in their own worthless works, and now they trust in Christ. This sees it as something that we get at salvation. We never lose it. And while we do not lose our salvation, and I grant that, the way of looking at our Christian life as one of rest, nah, it doesn't really fit, does it? Our Christian life has so much upheaval, even pain. We're told to pick up our cross. Our pilgrimage is described as an agony. So salvation, though it is sure, it's not something that we would call in this day our rest. Our full salvation yet waits, and so does our rest. And in fact, if we already had that rest at salvation, there'd be there'd be no need even for the stern warning that the writer is giving here. 
Another interpretation is to explain this rest as something that, well, it's what's often called a, a second blessing or a, a deeper consecration that takes place in the life of the believer, where they get to a point where they just sort of let go and let God. They just have faith. They just believe. And in that, there's this this relief. It's, uh, it's almost a, like a key, they say, to the Christian life, that if we will experience this second blessing, we'll have rest, we'll have victory over sin, we'll have freedom from all that which would disturb or bother us in our Christian life. Sin, its effects, temptation, they're all gone when we just embrace this key to the Christian life. Well, there are several problems with that interpretation. This sort of rest is one that is described as when we quit trying, as if we stop working. Uh, we quit trusting in ourselves. We just believe. And when we do that, then we, as it is stated, let go and we let God. So it's the idea that we have victory, we enter into this rest by just a, just a simple faith in Christ. We give up our efforts. It's a cessation of our works. Well, the idea that our efforts are contrary then, or, or even the problem itself, really does run foreign to the teaching of Scripture, but also to what we find here in this passage. Note the type of rest that's referred to here. There's an important change that the writer makes in verse 9. He uses the word rest, but it's a different word from the ones used throughout the passage. He chooses the word that is most commonly translated by the word Sabbath. It's the only time, in fact, this word is used in the epistles. And in doing so, what he does is point back to the Sabbath rest of God fulfilled by God at the end of his creation days, almost 6,000 some years ago now. He specifically states that in verse 10. Our rest is as God did from his. All right, this word has its primary meaning then as a rest, a Sabbath rest, of satisfaction or completion. It's not that God never worked again, but that his creation work was over. Why? Because it was, as he stated, good, even very good. Nothing more remained to be done. So the view that says this is the believer entering a rest through some key to the Christian life uh, that refers to a rest from sinning, that we stop trying to have victory over sin through our own efforts and belief. We just have faith. We just trust God. And then we have it. Victory. I no longer sin. Well, that's not at all descriptive of the work of God, how he did it in creation and then rested. The person of verse 10 doesn't quit doing works that are bad and leave work uncompleted. Rather, he finishes his job and nothing more remains to be done. God is pleased with his work, just as God was pleased with his own work and the finish of it on that sixth of the day. So a rest of finally learning a, a key to the Christian life that brings full and final victory looks upon the works done prior to that point as being bad, as being worthless, as being something we should give up and quit trying to do. Well, that's not the rest that is spoken of as God and his creation. It's not giving up work at all. It's instead finishing a work successfully, a rest of satisfaction, a rest where you look upon your work and say, that was work well done. Now it's over. I completed it. And importantly, when you look at chapter 4, uh, verse 11, it even tells us not to quit trying, to give up 
work. It says instead to let us labor to enter into that rest. So we have a rest before us. How do we get into it? Well, it's something that we labor to do. Far from stopping our work, we're exhorted to work harder. The rest does not come until we finish our work, our good work, like God did. Now, I admit, it sounds nice that if we could just grasp this thought of faith and believing and letting go and letting God. We wouldn't be able to sin anymore. Our sin nature would be defeated and gone. Uh, we wouldn't have labor or agony in this life. I recognize that holds out a prospect that would seem to be something that we would want, but it doesn't work that way. Even those people who claim to have gained that sort of rest would have to, if they were honest, admit it's just not so. It's not real life. It's not the Christian life. The key to entering into that rest, we're told, is to work, to labor. All right, so then how do we enter into it? Well, the answer to that is to see who is the he referred to in verse 10. Who enters the rest as our example, the one that we were to follow? Well, the he of verse 10 refers to Jesus Christ. There's all sorts of indications throughout that this is so. One of them is that Believers who are referred to in these verses, like in chapter 4, verses 1, 2, and 3, he uses the word we, plural. Verse 11, us, again, plural. The he of verse 10, though, is singular. Jesus, again, is the one who's focused on in this whole book. Someone who's seen as being better than anyone else. Like Moses, he's contrasted with him. Joshua, who did bring the people in the rest, contrasted with him. It is the one of whom David speaks, and that is the coming Messiah. Jesus finished perfectly and completely the work that God had for him to do on earth, and then he ascended to heaven. He comes or becomes for us the example of how we should persevere in this life, doing God's will now with a hope of rest, yet future, when we've completed our work, our agony, here in this life below. But Jesus is more than just an example for us. Here's Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Even in this statement, it shows that the one who is the he is Jesus. But it goes on and it says, We have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is the He, Jesus, the Son of God, our example. He did it. That's what verse 15 states. He knows the path we're on, and He made it home to the rest of heaven. But also verse 16 notes that He holds two offices that we do not. He is our example, but in other ways, He's more than that. He's some things that we are not. He's some things that we could never be. He is, verse 15, a high priest. And he is, verse 16, king on his throne. So, he can offer to us mercy when we fail, when we sin, when we give in to temptation, when we quit fighting, when we give in to fear, we stop agonizing in the faith. He can do that because he is high priest. And he can also offer grace, the strength to go on, because he is king. And this comes in time of need. Literally, it's timely help, right when we need it. Well, how do we get to him? 
Where is that throne? Where is that high priest? Well, if you've been following along in your Bibles, or even just noted the verse numbers as we read, you would have noticed I skipped from verse 11, which says we need to enter to labor into that rest, lest we fall like the people did in the wilderness. I skipped from verse 11 to verses 14 through 16, which speak of Jesus as our high priest and king. But the verses intervening, verses 12 and 13, it tells us where he is. So we can go to this priest and king for timely help. Verse 12 of Hebrews 4. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open in the eyes of him with whom we have to do. These are probably my most favorite verses in Scripture. I've preached on them, I think, more than any other. Just let me give a very brief version here of what we find. What we find is Jesus, our priest and king, our mercy and grace in the word of God. And you'll note there in verse 12, it begins that way, that the word of God, seemingly an, an impersonal, just like a book. And it's true, though, doesn't the Bible have that ability that's stated there to pierce us? It can be so convicting. It can lead to such guilt, a, a good guilt. We need to be made aware of our failing, our sin. But we must not wallow in it. Instead, that guilt is to drive us to our priest and king for mercy and grace, for forgiveness and power. And so verse 13, if you'll note, the impersonal becomes personal. The pronouns change to his and him. Our guilt, brought by looking in God's word, is cleansed. And the power to live for him is found. As we look in the scriptures and see Jesus revealed and even present, and we have then the strength to continue on in our agonizing, agonizing and pushing on towards that rest, laboring for it, bearing our cross, being faithful, keeping in the fight. So it is true in one sense that we let go and let God there is a key to the Christian life, but it's this. The key is Jesus. To continue to come to him, to admit our sin, and then receive his forgiveness. As we see him revealed to us, as we seek him in his word, the word of God, and in it experience his presence and his power. It's just like he said before he ascended before he passed into the heavens, as the writer of Hebrews puts it. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. He's here, he's present, and he speaks to us. When we come to him and seek for him in his word, the word of God. Discouragement, despair, depression, I don't mean to minimize them at all. They're very real. They're so common to man. But the answer is to not look at ourselves, and certainly not to give up. The answer is not found in us. But it is when we come to that place and see that we are hopeless, and then we look not to ourselves, but to the one who is in his rest, when we look to him, look to the heavens, and we see him there, as it were, when we come to him and we look for him in his word, we find there our forgiveness for our sin, mercy, and strength to continue on, grace from our priest and king. We look to Jesus. And then we get up, we pick up our cross, we continue in the fight, 
we keep on laboring to enter in to that rest still promised to us. There is a rest available to the people of God. Don't quit. Keep fighting, keep laboring, keep agonizing. Look to Jesus. He'll bring us home. Well, let's close then by singing the song that probably will cheer our hearts with just that thought. The song, My Hope is Jesus. on him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. <laughs>